you feel like yourself away. It's okay. It's all over. You're safe now. ground, face down, or the next one's for real. Turn him over. Take it easy, hop along. Well, if I hadn't run out of ammo, he never would have taken me alive. Is that right? Uh-huh. Let's go tough. Now, please, Carol, you have to take off those dirty clothes and take a bath. I don't want to take no bath. I want my mother. Where's my mother? Your mother and stepdad and stepsister were killed. No, they weren't. Yes, by Charlie Starkweather. He never laid a finger on him. Yes, he, he did. He was keeping him hostage. Where's my mother? I want my mother. I want to see her. You call her and you tell her to come and you tell her to bring Betty Jean, too. Oh, my God, you're here. I mean, she's so upset. Now, please, young lady, just try to calm down. Nobody's going to hurt you. I just need to do a routine examination to make sure that you're okay and everything's all right. I don't want anybody touching me. I want my mother. Will you just leave me alone? I want my mother. I want my mother. You're going to have to sedate her. Okay, okay. Hold her down, boys. Sorry I hurt you, Mom, because I know you try to raise me up right. But I'm not sorry for what I did, because for the first time, me and Carol had a lot of fun.
if she comes back, don't hate her. She had nothing to do with the killings. Respect Mr. Starkweather's privacy. He's had himself a trying day. Ain't some monkey in the zoo here. You're a big celebrity, boy. I've been getting phone calls from all over the world. Is that right? You gonna take me to see Carol? This ain't a motel, Charlie. You got some important visitors from back home. Bring them along. We also found a couple interesting things in the Packard, in the girl's jacket. There was some newspaper clippings about the crimes and a note asking the police to help. Just make sure everything gets sent back to Lincoln. Yes, sir. Mr. Shiel. If I were you, son, I'd reserve judgment on that. You see, I'm here to make sure you pay for these killings in the electric chair. I know. But I won't hold it against you. First thing we need, Charles, is for you to voluntarily agree to return with us to Nebraska. Okay. They got a gas chamber here, right? Right. Never much like the smell of gas. Why did you kill all these innocent people, Charles? Yes, I always wanted to be a criminal. But not this big. <laughs> you think that's funny? One thing, the only thing I'm gonna ask. Don't be rough on the girl. She didn't have a thing to do with any of this. Is that true, Charlie? Or are you just trying to protect her? Like I said, she had nothing to do with any of this. Girl in the other car. I made it back in them mountains. The fellas in need of the seventh cavalry flushed me out. I don't think President Eisenhower would have sent in the army. He knew what was going on. He 
knows he'd already killed ten people. Eleven. Kill eleven, not ten. Is there somebody we don't know about? No, about him, just ain't figured it out. Gas station boy. Bobby Culver? Yeah, he was the first. Oh, a few fellas have caught me on that one. The rest of them never happened. Talk to me. Come on, Carol, talk to me. Why'd you run away like that? I weren't right. You should have been with me to the end. Keep promise, remember? You made that oath, then I'd be killed old Gus. That's enough. No more talking. They ain't mad at you. Things did get a little crazy out there. Listen. They were gonna try and drive us apart. Don't let him. Don't say nothing. You let me do the talking. I ain't gonna tell you again. Now be quiet. I just wanna talk to her. She don't wanna talk to you. Now go to sleep. Anybody will read this. I will be dead for all the killings. And they cannot give Carol the chair. From Lincoln, Nebraska, they got us. January 29, 1958. 1958 killed 11 persons. Charles killed nine, all men. Carol killed two, all girls. Start with her and kill the day. For security reasons, Charles Starkweather is being held at the state penitentiary, while Carol Ann Fugate is being held here at the state mental hospital in Lincoln. The reason for this is because Nebraska law prohibits a minor from being held in a county or state jail. Carol, when you were inside the Ward House, did you ever have a loaded firearm in your hand? Yes. Did you point it at anyone? The maid. Why didn't you do that? Because Chuck told me to. All right. Now, 
Carol. Let's talk for a minute about the killings of the two teenagers. Starting right after they offered you a ride. We drove back to Bennett, but nothing was open. Where's the phone? It closed up early. That means they locked the phone up, too. You got any suggestions? Yeah. Let's head back towards Lincoln. Chuck, don't! And then Charlie had another idea. the old storm cellar. Get out. Now flashlight? Yeah, I think I have one of the trunk. Get it. What are you doing? Get her out of the car. No. Please let me stay here with you. You've got to do what he says. Otherwise, he's, he'll hurt you. Please. I'm sorry. It's okay. What are you going to do? Stay put till I get back. Out getting a cute chick like this. You can do what you want to me, but please just let her go. No! Stop it. Stop. Take it easy. It's going for a while. That was the last time you saw them alive. Yes, sir. Now, Carol, you do know how to shoot a gun, don't you? Yes, sir. Is Chuck the one who taught you? He used to go shooting for rabbits. And I'd come with him and shoot tin cans. Did you use a rifle or a shotgun? I think it was a rifle. I bet you're a pretty good shot, huh? Sometimes. Well, I'll do what I can, Charles. But I can't pull rabbits out of my hat. You signed a confession and told all sorts of people that you did the killings. That's right, I did. Then how do you expect me to plead you not guilty? Self-defense. Self-defense? You shot half of the people in the back. We'd be laughed out of court. It's your problem. Now, please, you have to understand, I'm here to help. I want to see you get a fair trial. But your only hope, slim as it is, would be to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. No way. I'd rather just skip the trial and go straight to the chair. Oh, Charles. No, I got a reputation uphold. I killed them because they had it coming. And that's it. Nobody remembers a crazy man. Hey! What's all the shouting about? Oh, it's just a little spirited discussion, that's all. Nothing to be concerned about. I don't care what the hell you do.
You know, you ought to be nice to Mr. Gone, Charlie. He's a good lawyer. He ain't good enough. Sheila's gonna chew him up and spit him out. Well, maybe so. You know, you ask me, I think your biggest problem is Carol Fugate. What the hell are you talking about? Well, she's been saying terrible things about you, Charlie. No, really. Shocking things. It's a lot of crap. Well, if you don't believe me, here it is. Black and white. Fugate told investigators she feared for her life every second. Stark weather was like a wild animal. Just killing people for the thrill of it all. John McCarthy. Nice to meet you. Please, sit down. Uh, you're even prettier in person than you are in the newspapers. Thank you. I don't know if anyone's told you who I am or why I'm here. I haven't been told anything. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Well, I'm an attorney, Carol. I've been asked by the court to represent you. Uh, you do know what an attorney is, don't you? It's kind of like a lawyer, right? It's exactly like a lawyer, just a different name for it. I've seen a lot of them on TV. Yes, well, that is different, Carol, because this isn't make-believe. This is a very serious business. And you're about to be charged for being an accessory to first-degree murder. Murder? I didn't kill anyone. It was Chuck. All they told me was that I was going to be a witness. That's all they said. And nobody's told you... You mean nobody's told you that you're going to stand trial for exactly the same crimes as Charles Starkweather? Nobody's told me anything. Nobody's even come to see me. Where's my sister and my grandma? I don't have no family no more. No friends. I just want to go home. Danny Street will take care of me. Carol, I don't want to upset you any more than you already are. But you have to understand something. You're in very serious trouble. For all my years of practicing law, the only thing I'm halfway sure of is my sixth sense. Now, I spent several hours questioning this child. She's in the eighth grade, Elmer. And she answered every question consistently, without hesitation. She didn't try to change the subject. I just don't think she's sophisticated enough to, to fool me. You obviously haven't read her confession. A confession? What confession? You have a statement. 
that she never signed and she never should have given without benefit of counsel. We followed the letter of the law, John. So you stretched the letter of the law from A all the way out to Z. Now look, this, this whole thing is just moving too fast. At the very least, I want to delay. Well, you may not need it. We're going to try them separately and start Weathers up first. We were hoping she might like to testify against him. No, 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 no way. If you call her, I'll have her take the fifth. Mm -hmm. Somehow I thought you might say that. Yeah, well, one, one more thing. Just so you know, I'm filing in the morning to have her case moved to juvenile court. I'll never let it happen. The law is very specific, Elmer. She's only 14. Well, Carol King was only 16, and Robert Jensen was only 17. I made a promise to these kids' parents, John, and I'm going to keep it. Carol Fugate is not going to have her wrist slapped in juvenile court. She's committed an adult crime, and she's going to be tried in an adult court. So, doctor, based on your psychiatric examination of Charles Starkweather, what exactly is your one overriding conclusion? That Charles Starkweather was suffering from a severe mental disease which prevented him from knowing right from wrong. And during your examination, doctor, did you ever observe any feeling on the part of the defendant for any of the alleged acts he was supposed to have committed? I don't believe he is capable of any real feelings, certainly not guilt or remorse. To him, the act of killing was no different than stepping on a bug. If his favorite automobile ran into a river, he might be sorry, but uh, a human life, well, that means nothing to him. Your witness. Dr. Quill, are you familiar with the legal test of sanity adopted and defined by our courts known as the McNaughton Rule? Yes. Could you briefly summarize this rule for us, please? Simply stated, it says an accused person need only be aware of the nature and quality of the criminal act and know the act was wrong when it was committed. And using the McNaughton rule, is it possible that someone suffering from a medically recognized mental illness could still be legally sane at one and the same time? Yes, sir. That's all, Your Honor. There's certainly no legal reason why they should move your case to a juvenile court. It's absolutely incredible to me that the Supreme Court of this state could reject this appeal. They're just playing politics with this thing. What does that mean? It means you're going to have to stand trial in a real courtroom, an adult courtroom, just like Charlie. God. They'll concentrate on the murder of the boy and the related charge of murder during the commission of a robbery. And they see they're not accusing you of actually pulling the trigger, but they don't have to. Just being an accessory makes it a capital offense. Well, are they, are they going to give me the chair, too? No, no. They're not going to give you the chair. Don't even start thinking about that. They have absolutely no physical evidence. And I can't believe that there is a jury anywhere that's going to take the word of Charlie Stark with her. I thought he told them that I was innocent. Well, that's the other thing. Charlie's changing his story. <laughs> Seems like he comes out with a brand new confession every other day or so. What about the, the note that I wrote to the police asking them for help? I mean, that must show that I was trying to get away. Unfortunately, nobody can find that note. The sheriff in Wyoming, he remembers taking it out of your jacket. He, he claims he sent it on to Lincoln. The prosecution says they never saw it. Seems like I'm never going to get out of this place. You will help me, won't you? Of course I'm gonna help. Listen, Carol, that's the one thing I can absolutely guarantee you. I will never, ever stop fighting to get you out of here. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, do not believe when the prosecution argues that not guilty by reason of insanity means that someday Charles Starkweather will go free. Not even an act of Congress could ever make that happen. Our society, which spawned this young man, 
has ironclad, uncompromising rules to ensure the proper punishment of the criminally insane. Now, if you decide that revenge must triumph over reason, that two wrongs do make a right, I will ask each of you to come with me when I bring my client to the death house. There, with his trousers cut to his knees and his arms stripped bare, you will see him strapped in that chair and watch as the switch is pulled. We will all stand back in horror as the electricity surges, the smoke comes from his head and his lifeless body falls forward. In the name of mercy and the great commandment, thou shalt not kill. I ask you for the life of Charles Starkweather. I understand you have reached a verdict. We have, Your Honor. We find the defendant guilty on all counts, and it is our unanimous recommendation his penalty should be death in the electric chair. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you. You are now dismissed. Hey, Chief, Charlie. Come on, give me a best man dog luck. Carol Fugate, you plan to help her? Yeah, when they strap me in the chair and pull the switch, I'm gonna make sure Carol's right there with me. Sit in my lap. You had no right to change her hairstyle, not without my permission. Need I remind you, sir, that she's my prisoner and not yours? If I had wanted to shave her head, that's my prerogative. You knew we had scheduled this interview for today. Somebody put you up to this, didn't they? Huh? I resent that. Now, you apologize to me. The girl needed a haircut, and we cut her hair. Excuse me. What was that all about? By sheer coincidence, they cut Carol's hair. Today. They gave her spit curls. Totally changes her appearance. She looks five years older. I wish I'd never let you talk me into this. Whatever you do when you see her, don't mention her hair. She's nervous enough as it is. That makes two of us. Excuse me. Turn this way, please. Right here, please. Gentlemen, please. Hold up. Right here, please. Look up. Yeah. Unless everybody quiets down and the photos stop, we will not begin. In fact, you keep this up. I'm going to call this whole thing off right now. As you know, I've strongly opposed my client granting any press interviews because I believe pre-trial publicity is improper, detrimental to the defendant's right to a fair trial. Unfortunately, the prosecution has decided to use you people to whip up such a, a frenzy of negativity against Carol Ann Fugate. We felt we had no choice but to let her take her case to the people. <clears throat> now, as we planned, there'll only be one person asking questions, Jonette Fox. Jonette? Now, Carol, before this all began, didn't you go out with Charlie Starkweather for quite a while? Yes, I went with him the year before, and then I told him that I never wanted to see him again. 
Why didn't you want to go out with him anymore? Because he was crazy. Since nobody's seen you since your capture, there's been a rumor you were pregnant and secretly had Charles Starkweather's baby. No, I've never been pregnant. And I've never had a baby. And I'm not pregnant now. When was the first time you found out that your parents and little sister were dead? When we were captured. Out there in the desert? Yes. Now, Charlie said in one of his confessions that you held a gun on the victims. That's not true. How about when the policeman came to your front door? Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you try to escape then? Because Charlie Starkweather had a gun on me, and he would have killed us both. Did you ever break down and cry or beg him to let you go? Yes, I cried all the way. Do you think Charlie got what he deserved when he was convicted to the electric chair? I'm no little brat. I wish they'd called me for this jury. So you are not Push up a minute. Condemn him for what he did. Again, and it's not my place to say. Chief Louise, do you believe that? I understand. Listen, I got 50 big ones that says she gets the chair, too. Make it a dollar, you got a bet. Oh, a dollar it is. And Deputy Romer, did you have any further conversations with Carol Fugate before you arrived in Douglas? Yes, sir. Right before we got into Douglas, she told me she had seen Mr. Starkweather kill ten people. Ten people? Did she say who they were? She said she had seen him kill her mother, her stepfather, her stepsister, a boy and a girl, a farmhand, and four other people. So she said to you that she was present when her mother Stepfather and stepsister were killed. Yes, sir. I'm going to object to this as leading. It is leading. Objection sustained. No further questions, Your Honor. <clears throat> Deputy Romer, when you first encountered Carolyn Fugate there in Wyoming, was she at any time armed? Or did you see her aiding and abetting Starkweather in any way? No, sir. Now, you stated that she was hysterical. What do you mean by that? Well, she was sobbing and crying. She could hardly talk. Did you get the impression that she was afraid of Starkweather while he was still on the loose? Yes, sir, I did. <clears throat> did you hear what was told to Carol Ann to get her to return to Nebraska? I heard some of it. Did she have any attorney present to advise her of her rights during this interview? No, sir. She didn't. Thank you. John, you have to admit it was a pretty good day for the prosecution. That was one of their prime witnesses. What about the inconsistencies in Carol's story? How could she say she didn't know her parents were dead if she told the deputy she'd seen them killed? She was hysterical. She didn't know what she was saying. Besides, he remembers it the way he wants to remember it. John, Excuse me. John, At this time, the people would like to call Charles R. Starkweather. Objection! We've not been advised that this witness would be called. Your Honor, his name was submitted on our list of possible witnesses. A along with a thousand other people, it was never specified that Starkweather would be called to testify. Objection over rule. Is he outside? Then bring him in. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Mr. Shield? Charles, when you arrived at the Bartlett House on January 21st, who was there? The baby, and Carol's mother, and Mr. Bartlett. And what happened then? I got in an argument with Mrs. Bartlett. She slapped me, so I done hit her back. She screamed and her husband come in. 
And then? I shot him. And her, too. And the baby, Betty Jean? I threw a knife at her. What are you doing back? Where's your husband? What are you doing? during all of this. She was in another room. I'll say, um, 2.45. 2.45 is Mrs. Leon's final bid. Mrs. Young, you're at 125. Top bid is 2.45. This is your last bid. You kill him? Betty Jean, too? Yeah. Didn't stop screaming. Good riddance. I was getting so sick of her always yelling. Can I help him clean up this mess? You made the mess, you clean it up. Gotta get him out of here. Chuck, can you see my favorite television programs on? Did you remain at the Barlett house that evening? Yeah, except when I went out to buy a few things. And when you left, Charles, did you do anything to Carol, like tie her up? Nope. And you left the house several other times over the next few days. Yeah. Every day I left to get something or make a call. And you never tied her up on any of those occasions? No, sir, never. Now, Charles, let's talk about the killing of the two teenagers, Robert Jensen and Carol King, <clears throat> starting right after they Stopped and offered you a ride. Well, after they picked us up. Could you speak up, please? I'm, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> after they picked us up, we went to Bennett to make a phone call. The phone was locked. So where's the phone? It closed up early. And that means they locked the phone up too. Got any suggestions? Yeah. Let's head back towards Lincoln. God, please. That's not funny. Nobody's laughing. Don't worry. You're not gonna hurt us. Isn't that right? You do as we say, or I'll kill her right now. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. the kind who wants to hurt anybody. I know, I can tell, I really can. And I want to thank you. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> Did you get his money? I ain't no magician. Give me your billfold. Charles, where was Carol when you took the Jensen boy and the King girl down into the storm cellar? She was waiting by the car. What the hell you been doing down there so long? I had to take care of the boy. The girl gave me some trouble. That she did. Come on, don't be sore at me. Let's go back to the farm. 
<laughs> I don't think so. I think you done about had enough for one night. She's still alive. Yeah. What are you doing? It's your contention that Carol Pugate is the one who killed Carol King. Yes, sir. And you also maintain that Lillian Fensel, the maid in the ward house, was also killed by Miss Pugate. I didn't kill the maid, I didn't kill that girl. Both of them was definitely alive when I left them. Mr. MacArthur. Charles. Why did you kill Carol Fugate's stepfather? Because he come at me. And her mother? She threatened me with a knife and a little baby. I don't want to talk about those murders. Oh, I can understand that, John. But you said earlier, you did kill little Betty Jean, didn't you? I said, I threw a knife at her. Didn't say I killed her. I see. Now, oh, Charles. I'm handing you a copy of a photo. The reporter is marked exhibit number 27. This is a photo of the confession that you wrote on the wall of the Gehring jail cell in your extradition back to Lincoln. Is that correct? Yeah. Now, according to this confession, you said Charles killed nine. All men. Carol killed two. All girls. I don't understand, Charles. You, of all people, should know. There were six males and five females killed. I ain't never been too good at adding things up. You ain't never been too good at telling the truth, either. Objection, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Strike that last statement from the record. You realize, Charles, that you were... Uh... You have given the authority something like seven or eight different accounts of how each killing took place? All different. Oh. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, in your statement to Mr. Shields, <clears throat> signed and dated February 2nd, 1958, you answered the question, did Carol Fugate ever fire a weapon at one of the victims? If she did, I didn't see it. You also said the night of the Bartlett family killings, I tied up Carol real tight to make sure she'd be there when I got back. You also said in a recorded phone conversation with your parents, Carol had nothing to do with the killings. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. In your confession in Wyoming, January 28th, weren't you asked, did Carol Fugate ever know you killed her family? And didn't you answer, no, I don't believe so? That's what I said. It ain't true. All that stuff you're reading is a bunch of hogwash. Hogwash? Hogwash? Just like everything you've said here today. Objection. Badgering the witness. Sustained. Mr. MacArthur. I believe that's all. Mr. Shield? Just a few more questions, Your Honor. Now, Charles... You have admitted to some falsehoods in some of your earlier confessions. That's right. But in your later confessions, after you were in the state penitentiary, those were all pretty consistent, all truthful and accurate. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. So why did you give us those earlier statements? To protect her. Let the record show he pointed at the defendant, Carol Fugate. And why did you decide to stop protecting Carol Fugate? Because I got tired of lying. Look, I'm going to die. I'm going to get what's coming to me. 
So I got nothing to win or lose by any of this. I don't care if you people believe me or not. But I'm through alibiing for. She was no more a hostage than I was. Hell, yeah, Carol was in on it every step of the way. You convicted me for what I'd done. That's okay. But I ain't covering for her no more. That's the truth. I believe that's all, Your Honor. Sheriff, you may return the witness. Well, it's coming up in the hour, so I think this is a good time to take our afternoon recess. The spectators will remain seated until the jury has left the room. And I want the jury to remember the admonitions I have given you many times. Do not talk among yourselves or with anyone else about the case. I'm free to go. It's an anonymous letter. We don't know if it's true. Well, why don't we assume for a second that it is true? Let's just assume that... Uh... One of our jurors made a public bet that Carol Ann Fugate would get the electric chair. Can I assume you're going to declare a mistrial? Assumption's the mother of all screw-ups, John. The fact is, we have no intention to ask for the death penalty. <laughs> I really think you're blowing this out of proportion, John. You have to be kidding, Elmer. Elmer's right. Even if this is true, we are not going to start it all over again. Hell, I doubt that we could find a potential juror who doesn't believe that girl is guilty. I'm going to quote you on that when this goes to the Court of Appeals. Oh, that's your prerogative. My question is, why are we even going through this charade? Why don't you just take the girl out and hang her from a tree? You control yourself, Counselor. You hear me? John, there's no great conspiracy here. The problem is, you seem to be the only one in the state of Nebraska who doesn't know she's guilty. No, no, the problem is, I seem to be the only person in the state of Nebraska who still believes in the United States Constitution. Now, Carol, what went through your mind when you first saw Robert Jensen's automobile pull up and, uh, and they offered you a ride? Well, I was relieved because I'd been thinking that Charlie was going to kill me, too, just like he did Mr. Myers. And he asked Robert Jensen if he'd give us a ride into town so that we could use a telephone. But when we got there, it was all locked up. That's when he put the gun to Robert Jensen's head and told him to keep driving. He closed up early. And that means they locked the phone up, too. You got any suggestions? Yeah. Let's head back towards Lincoln. No, let me take you to another phone. I know who it is! I do! <laughs> don't talk back to me. Or I'll shoot you right here. Oh my god. No, Chuck, don't shoot him. Please don't hurt him! Shut up. You side John anyhow. Then what happened after that? Well, he asked Robert if he had any money, so Robert handed him his billfold with some dollars in it, and Chuck took the money and handed it to me to hold. Now, what was Carol King doing through all this? Nothing. She was too scared. Mm. Well, you heard Charles Starkweather say she thanked him for being so good to her. No, sir. That's not true. She never said a word. All he ever did was scream at her, especially when we got out to the old storm cellar. And that's when you told her to get out of the car? Yes, sir. Carol, can you tell us why you felt the need to point the gun at Carol King? Well, I had to. Chuck told me to. And you were afraid if you didn't follow his order... Well, he'd kill us all. After the girl got out of the car, I asked him again if he please wouldn't hurt them. He just told me to shut up, to stay in the car. How long before you saw or heard anything else? Well, I was shaking the whole time. And a few minutes later, I heard the shots being fired. I started to cry because I knew what he'd done. You want this? Carol, why didn't you jump out of the car and run away? I couldn't move, sir. I was frozen in with a fright. Did the thought ever cross your mind to take your father's gun and to do something to Charles Starkweather? No, sir. I never killed anybody, sir. 
How long after the shots were fired did you wait in the car? It seemed like a very long time, sir. Why did you have to shoot them? What were you doing down there? Why did you do that? <laughs> you tried to jump me. She's dead. He's still alive. And the squirm, he deserves it. Come on. Let's go. Where are we going now? Maybe I'll take you home. But instead, you ended up in South Lincoln, at the home of C. Lauer Ward. Yes, sir. After that, he told me to go and lie down on the Davenport. And that's when I woke up that he told me that he killed Mrs. Ward. And then he handed me the murder knife and he told me to go take it to the sink and wash it off. You know, blood off it. Doing the best I can. Go in the bedroom. Get rid of the smell. What? Find something. Charles, bring the maid back upstairs. It was after dark because I was standing at the window with the flashlight. He told me to do that so that I could make sure and see if anybody came home. Starkweather talked to you while he was driving? Yes, sir. I kept asking him about my family, telling him how much I wanted to see him. I begged him to take me home, but all he'd ever say was no. Now, speaking of home, Carol, when you left school that day, you returned home to find an armed Charles Starkweather waiting inside the house. Yes, sir. And for the next five days, you were his hostage. Yes, sir. Do you recall the first time that Starkweather left you alone in the house? Not really. It was at night. I tore up a piece of my mother's dishcloth, and he tied my hands behind my back, and then he tied my feet together, and then he tied those to the chair. And he left me like that every time he'd leave the house. he or she makes every day at work. That's right, one of these sets of movements earns a person a weekly paycheck. The other two are doing nothing.
nothing. We want you to find the person who's reenacting his or her daily job. I'll give you a close look before you decide. Now, let's meet our next contestant. Excuse me, sir, what's your name? Versus Don't leave me down. alone, Charlie. California. Occupation? Charlie? Charlie, don't leave me here. Carol, during your captivity, some relatives, even some police, came to the front door. Why didn't you try to warn them? I did. Charles Starkweather said that he'd shoot anybody that walked in the door, and I did write that note for everybody to see. You mean the note that you attached to the front door while you were there in the house with Starkweather? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm handing you it's been identified as Exhibit 45. Would you please tell the court what it says? Stay away. Everybody is sick with the flu. Sign Miss Bartlett. And who is Miss Bartlett? My sister. Miss Bartlett is my sister, sister. She's too little to write a note. My last name is Fugate. My mother never would have signed it that way. So, you were trying to send a warning. Yes, sir. Just like you tried to send a warning when you took Bobby Jensen's and Carol King's school books and you threw them out of their car. Yes, sir. Well, I figured that somebody would open them up and see the names and at least they'd start looking for them. <laughs> Carol, how did you feel when Charles Starkweather was brought into this courtroom to testify against you? I was scared stiff. And why is that? I don't know. I figured somehow we'd get loose. He's trying to kill me. <laughs> Take a break, Shakespeare. It's dinner time. Hey, Calvin. People always got in my way. And everybody blames me for hitting back. But if you pull the chain on a toilet, you can't blame it for flushing, can you? Charlie, what are you planning to do with all that scribbling? I'm getting it published. Parade magazine. I got a contract and everything. Yeah, well, you better write fast. I hear they're getting ready to set a date with the electrocutioner. Well, at least I know for once I'll get a decent meal. Hey, uh, you hear about your little girlfriend in court today? Yeah. Level with me, Charlie. I mean, about you and the girl. You really love her? Before I met her, I hated everybody, everything. And I started a new way of thinking. I had something to live for. How long didn't matter. Just as long as we were together. And then you turned on her. She turned on me first. I had protected her to the end. I really would have. Carol, you have admitted to having numerous opportunities to escape and that on several occasions you had a loaded firearm in your hand when Charles Starkweather either had his back turned to you or he was unarmed. Isn't that correct? Yes. If you were so afraid he was going to kill you, why didn't you just shoot him? I didn't know how. You didn't know how to shoot the gun? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes. Carol, in your confession, which you gave to me in front of several witnesses... Objection! Objection! Miss Fugate never gave any confession. And the statement that Mr. Shield is referring to was given without benefit of any counsel and was never signed by Miss Fugate. 
Overruled. However, you may omit the word confession from the record. You may proceed. All right, I am reading now from your statement. Question. Now, Carol, you do know how to shoot a gun, don't you? Carol, yes, sir. Question. Is Chuck the one who taught you? Carol, yes. Question. Did you use a rifle or a shotgun? Carol, I think it was a rifle. Question. I bet you were a pretty good shot. Carol, sometimes. Do you recall telling me that? No, I don't remember. You don't remember saying that? No. Well, is it true? Do you or do you not know how to shoot a firearm? I don't know how to kill anybody. Well, let's go back for a minute to the killings of the teenagers. Did you at any time point a gun at the King girl and tell her to get out of the car? I had to. Charlie Starkweather told me to. Well, if Charles Starkweather had told you to shoot her, would you have done that too? No! Objection! Argumentative! Sustained. Now, when you and Chuck were going together, did he treat you pretty well? Yes. Did he buy you things? Sometimes. And did you buy him things? Sometimes. In fact, didn't you and Chuck open a savings account in both your names at the First National Bank? No. You sure of that now, Carol? Well, the way you're saying it makes it sound like we went and did it together. And Charles Starkweather opened a bank account and he asked me to sign in in case he got killed while he was running around with that gang he was in. But isn't this the bank's signature card you both signed when you opened up your joint account? I didn't sign it at the bank. He brought it to my house. But this is your signature, and you did sign it. Let the record show that the witness nodded in the affirmative. Carol, now when you and Chuck were alone at your house after he killed your parents, did you and he engage in any... Sexual relations? Objection. Your Honor, this is an attempt to introduce inflammatory, prejudicial matter into the record. It is entirely outside the scope of this case. Overruled. Answer the question. I don't know what he means. Well, you do know what sexual intercourse is, don't you? Yes. Did you and Charles Starkweather engage in sexual intercourse during the time you were at your house? Yes. And how many times did you have sexual relations there with Charles Starkweather? Objection! And, and the form of the question is improper, Your Honor. Overruled. This line of questioning is allowed. How many times did you have sexual relations at your house with Charles Starkweather? I think twice. And how about after the three killings in the Ward House? At any time after that, did you have sexual relations with Charles Starkweather? Yes. And where did that take place? In the car on the way to Wyoming. And did you at any time following the Ward murders kiss Charles Starkweather? Yes. And did you at any time tell Charles Starkweather that you loved him? Yes, but only because he said he was going to kill me. Please just answer the question yes or no. Yes. I believe that's all, Your Honor. By her own admission, Carol Fugate warned Charles Starkweather that a policeman was at the front door. And she also admitted to having numerous other opportunities to escape or warn others during this murderous rampage. And let's not forget, ladies and gentlemen, that Carol Fugate admitted to having voluntary sexual relations with Charles Starkweather after she had witnessed the savage killings of his innocent victims. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the true nature of their relationship. They were lovers and they were partners. And between them, they left a trail of bloodshed and horror, the likes of which this country has never seen before. But even 14-year-olds must realize that they cannot just go on eight-day murder sprees. No, ladies and gentlemen. The time has come for Carol Fugate to face the consequences of her conduct. And the time has come for you to send an unequivocal message to violent criminals of all ages. If you break the law, you will be caught. 
If you break the law, you will be prosecuted. And if you break the law, you will be punished. Mr. MacArthur. Let me be very blunt, ladies and gentlemen. The twelfth victim of Charles Starkweather is Carol Ann Fugate. And the thirteenth victim may very well be our Bill of Rights. Why do I say that? Because the legal system I so cherish and support has totally collapsed around this case. This community's almost tribal need for vengeance, whipped up daily by sensational newspaper headlines, has turned this trial into a 16th century witch hunt. with the state's prime witness being Lucifer himself. Can anybody seriously believe the testimony of a madman like Charles Starkwood? And without accepting his, his incredible and inconsistent allegations as the gospel truth, where is the physical evidence required? Required! To convict Carol Ann Fugate. The county prosecutor wants you to consider that Carol may have had some physical chances to escape, but he wants you to forget her mental state of being during this nightmare. Remember what happened to the older, wiser, and stronger people who defied Charles Starkweather during his reign of terror. The prosecution also wants you to ignore the fact that this girl, this child, this child, was only 14. An eighth grader, with no history of any disciplinary problems, yet somehow, overnight, she was transformed into a wild-eyed killer, only to revert back to her peaceable nature, the second the Charles Starkweather was captured? No, 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 no. There is only one rational explanation here, that Carol Ann Fugate was too young, too confused, too terrified to act in any other way. And even when she tried to send a warning with a note signed by a two-year-old who obviously could not write, her plea for help was ignored. Every action or inaction that she is accused of occurred while she was being held hostage by the most feared and savage mass murderer in the history of this country. <clears throat> she was 14, ladies and gentlemen, 14. Now, please, you must remember that. Think back to when you, or, or your children, or your grandchildren, were that befuddled age. Then ask yourself if you, or they, could have witnessed such violence and not been traumatized. Ask yourself if you, or they, at 14, would surely possess the courage, the, 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 the presence of mind, to physically challenge a monster like Charles Starkweather Finally, ask yourself if you or they, at the age of 14, would have acted any differently than Carol Ann Fugate. And if your answer is yes, oh, yes, yes, I certainly would have acted differently, well, then ask yourself if you're equally certain that you or they, your children, 
your grandchildren, would still be alive today to tell us about it. Thank you. I understand you have reached a verdict. We have, Your Honor. Would you please read the verdict? On the charge of murder in the first degree with premeditation and malice, we find the defendant not guilty. <laughs> On the charge of murder in the first degree while in the perpetration of a robbery, we find the defendant guilty as charged. I remind you that these proceedings are not over. And it is our recommendation her sentence should be life imprisonment. Dear Mr. President, I'm now 15 years old. A year and a half ago on a day, I was in public school. 19-year-old Charlie Starkweather killed my two-year-old baby sister, my mother, and my stepfather. Starkweather later confessed that I had nothing to do with his murder, which is true. Later, he changed his story and said that I helped him, which is not true. At midnight on June 25th, Starkweather will be executed, and I have been denied by our governor a request to see him. I still think that he may tell the truth before he is executed. I know that you are very busy, President Eisenhower, but please help me in any way you can. As I have nowhere else to turn because he killed all the family that I was living with. Sincerely, Caroline Fugate. I think it's very good. I'd sure want to help you. Do you think I'll get it in time? We'll just send a telegram right away. I want to write Chuck one last letter. I really don't see the point, Carol. I mean, he hasn't answered any of your letters. I know. There's something I have to do. Okay. You write him the letter? Dear Chuck, with so little time left, I'm asking you once again to please tell the truth about what happened. Please tell him I had nothing to do with the killings. You know I'm innocent. Please tell the truth. Carol.
Time's come, Charlie. What's your hurry? Entirely a state matter. The president has no jurisdiction or authority in any way to comply with your request. Final thing you'd like to say, Charles? Yeah. You can tighten the straps a little loose. <laughs> 